discerning the times, discerning the times. And our passage of scripture is 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and it's verse 23 and 32. And, and, and the reason why I'm skipping down is because it's giving these numbers of the leaders of the tribes of Israel. And they're numbering them for, for war. And the war is this, there's, there's a, a earthly king on the throne, man is ruling. God has his king that he wants to establish on the throne. And so they're numbering these men on how many are taking a stand for David, for God's chosen king. And David is a picture of Christ for us in the throne uh, in the Old Testament. And so this is a beautiful picture of understanding for us of what it takes to usher in and to put the proper king on the throne. So this is what's happening. And so we begin reading in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 in verse 23. And it says, these are the numbers of the men armed for battle armed for battle, who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him as the Lord had said. Verse 32, when it, and then it goes through the tribes. When we get down to verse 32, it says, from Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel or God's people were to do. There were 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. You see, these are those who were armed for battle to transfer this current kingdom over to God, to God's king, which is for us a picture of Jesus. You see, a righteous king was coming. A righteous king was coming, but there was going to be a fight in the process. So when it tells us that they were armed for battle, let me give you what the word armed means. Armed here means equipped. So when it says these were men armed for battle, it means that they were equipped. It means that they were strengthened, that God gave them the strength that they needed. They were stripped of hindrances. It means to be stripped of hindrances that would impede or restrict their duty. Listen, the duty at hand. And to be ready or prepared. To be ready or prepared. And the church, the church, when the church tries to teach things, and we've experienced this in, in, the, in our own ministry at JBOC, especially the teaching of God's Word. When the church tries to arm itself with truth and understanding of the times, there's always going to be a backlash. Because the darkness does not like to be exposed by the light. Because when you take something and you bring it into the light, it exposes what's wrong. And the light meaning Jesus or the truth of God's word. Because as we started this series, we know who truth is. We know where truth is. We know the source of truth. And everything that's out there, we have to be able to bring it in and align it to see how it lines up with God's word. But we also so in order to do that, we have to know what's out there. We have to know what's out there. So we can't discern, discern the times if we don't understand what the times are. So these men were armed for battle. And when you get down to Issachar, we see that they discern the times and how God's people should respond, what they were to do in light of the times at hand. So understood, let me give you what this word understood, when we're told that they understood the times. It means knowledge, wisdom, and meaning. They understood the knowledge of the times. They had knowledge of what was going on. They had wisdom of what was going on. And they had meaning. They understood. Listen, it's, it's, not, it's not just about having the, the knowledge, but you got to understand what's the meaning beneath that knowledge. What is the hidden agendas? What is the meaning? And so as God's people, my heart is, and I believe it's God's heart, based on his word for his people to be able to discern the time so we can know how to respond appropriately. And we can't be ostriches. We can't keep our head down in the sand and pretend that it's not, not happening. And we can't bubble ourselves off. 
We can't do that. One commentator writes about this right here, and I, I saw this in a quote because I do not use commentaries. Um, not normally. One commentator writes of this. It says, those who discern the times, it speaks of those who were intelligent. They were educated in it. They understood the signs that were present. Well-versed in political affairs. Well-versed in political affairs. And they knew what was proper to be done in all the pressures of human life. They perceived it as their duty, their responsibility. It's our responsibility because we have been given the truth. We're to be truth bearers. We're to be truth proclaimers. And listen, we're to, we're to line up everything. How does this philosophy line up with God's word? How does this politician over here running for office line up to God's word and what he stands for or she stands for? We can't be an ostrich with our head in the sand any longer. God's people need to come to the scene. We need to step onto the scene and we need to know what's happening. You see, we will never be equipped to install Jesus on the throne of, listen, our nation, this country, or anywhere in the world for that matter, any other country, if we do not have the knowledge and wisdom of the times we're living in. You see, a, a solid understanding of those things that are plaguing our children in the classrooms and our colleges, our young adults in every area of their lives and fighting, listen, these things that are fighting to chart their course away from the one true living God. As God's people, we ought not to be okay with that. We ought not to be okay with that. So point number one, understanding our times. Point number one, understanding our times. I hope that you're taking notes. The enemy is out to remove truth. We know that, to redirect our course away from God. And he does it under a lot of different guises. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, he always, he'll slither in in any opening that he can get, any dialogue that he can get going with us through people in our thoughts, our situations. And in that dialogue, what he wants to do is propose that there's something better out there than truth. He wants to propose that it's really all about you. It's all about you and what you want, the life you want to live, how you want to live it, that you are your own source of truth. And that's the lie that he has packaged from the beginning of time. He just rewraps it a little bit different with each and every generation. Well, we have to unwrap these things and we have to see what they are. Paul wrote to Timothy these words. Now, these, this is the last letter that, that Paul is going to write. And you would think that what you're going to say, it's his last letter we know, and it's to Timothy. He's about to be martyred. His words are important. They have, they have some weight to them. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, 8, and 9. And I think we forget these verses as God's people. He says, but realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of self. They're going to love themselves. Lovers of money. They will be boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. Means we can't come to a ground of agreement. Malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And he says, avoid such people as these. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind, worthless in regard to faith. But they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be obvious to all. There is such foolishness in our culture today. Foolishness. 
But the hidden agendas is what we as God's people need to expose. When Paul told Timothy, difficult times are going to come in the last days, realize it, know it, recognize it. Difficult here, let me give you what this word means, difficult, because I think we can read through this passage and not lay hold of what difficult means. Difficult means hard to bear. It's going to be hard to bear the times that we live in towards the end. And I believe we are towards the end. It's going to be hard to bear. It's going to be troublesome times. If, if you're not troubled by our times, then I don't think you know what's going on. We ought to be troubled. It means dangerous, fierce, savage, and times that reduce one's strength. It's going to be challenging to understand the times toward the end, the times, the culture, times just speaks of culture. The culture is going to be hard to understand. It's going to be troublesome, hard to bear, challenging. It's going to zap our strength. It's going to be fierce and savage. A lady in, at, at the women's thing that I just got back from Women of Legacy last week, she's an older woman and very successful, and she gives and supports a lot of causes that further the gospel, that further the Christian uh, teachings and the moralities that line up with God's Word. And she was sitting there and she just, you know, had her head and she said, I, I just one day I was reading this and she was said, I, she watched somebody sent her this documentary and she said, I was shocked. And I asked myself, how did we get here? When did this happen? When did all of this happen? She said, I've had my nose to the grindstone and we've been doing good and we've been in the trenches. But when did this happen? It's as if, you know, we're down here doing our work and we come up. You know, like those little meerkats, we just pop up out of a hole and we look around and we go, ah, and we retreat back to our hole because we don't know what to do. We can't believe it's so ludicrous and it's so foolish. And you think, how can anybody embrace these things and why are they doing it? Well, we have an enemy who's very powerful, very destructive. He's a devourer. And so it has happened. Some of the controversial and difficult things that are assaulting our faith and peace, our peace today in this country and around the world. But we know firsthand in our country that's plaguing my children's future, my grandchildren's future, my great-grandchildren that I hope God lets me live long enough to see. It's, a, it's impacting, it's threatening their future too. So what are some of the things that are just most popular, these phrases and terms that we hear a lot, and what do they mean? Because we need to discern the times, don't we? We need to have the knowledge of them. So, a, well, here they are. There are four. The woke movement, and then we're going to look at them briefly. The woke movement, critical race theory, cancel culture, social injustice. So the woke movement critical race theory, cancel culture, social injustice. And there's a lot of terms that are continuing to emerge and it takes some years for some, most of them to get some footing under them. Because a lot of these uh, belief systems have been in place for a while. They just got traction in recent years over things that have happened. Uh, in, in, in society that have made the news, that have plagued social media. Our young people are latching on to these things under the premise that it's a good cause. And they don't understand the agendas hidden beneath the surface of a good cause or what is presented as a good cause. So the woke movement what does the woke movement mean and what does it stand for? And I'll give the most information about the woke movement because underneath the woke movement, critical race theory, cancel culture, and social injustice is all tied to the woke movement. So the woke movement, if you understand it at least a little bit, you'll be able to grasp the, it's like a, the, the arms and the legs, you know, the, the shoots off of the woke movement, they're all tied to the same agenda. 
There are discrepancies when you study the history of the woke movement, uh, its origin, who really started or birthed the term in the movement and ideology of woke. Who started it? Well, it, it, it's tied to back in the civil rights movement. It just was labeled differently, consciousness. Um, it it kind of uh, morphed into to be awake or the woke movement. It did, however, begin in the black community. But in recent years, it has gained great momentum as well as change in its dynamic from when it began. So I want you to understand a lot of things start off good. And then people come along and, they, and they, they find a mask or a disguise to further an evil agenda behind that mask of good. The movement has expanded into other perceived social justice areas, as I've just read. In brief, woke is a term used to explain an awakening to issues of race, gender, and sexual injustice, like the Me Too movement. Now, these are, are, are things that I believe we do need to know. I, I do believe that issues of discrimination on any level, any racial discrimination, uh, or even gender discrimination, discrimination in and of itself is wrong. And so these things sound, sound good. And sexual injustice, those that have been sexually abused in that uh, Me Too movement that, that just kind of derailed and went into all of these crazy things. But women were speaking up about things. And listen, from someone who, who experienced that as a child growing up, I have a tender heart for those who have been sexually abused. So I, I get that that's a real need. No one's going to get that more than me. I get that. I get that. So the woke movement has, like I said, a lot of different branches to it. But it means to be, uh, to be woke means social awareness to what's happening, being alert to social issues, to that racism we've said, discrimination and injustice. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I think we need to be aware of those things. We need to stand against injustices that, that are true injustices. We need to, to, to correct ourselves in a lot of areas. And this sounds like a good movement to be aware of these things. So what is it really all about? Wokeism, the woke movement, has ties. It's rooting in its nature and fundamental belief to the Marxist theology. If I ask you how many of you have heard the word Marxist, the Marxist theology, if you haven't, I'm fixing to tell you about it. Marx, where the word it came from, Marx, M-A-R-X, is the biographical name of Karl Heinrich. And Karl Heinrich was uh, born in the 1800s. He was a German political philosopher and socialist. So socialism was what he pushed. From his philosophy came the Marxist system of belief and influence, which at its core is socialism. If you want to know what socialism is, research Cuba. The woke movement started off with well-intentioned people that wanted to stop racism and social injustice. And so it began good. It had the right reason to begin this movement. It has now, though, however, morphed into a belief system that seeks to silence all who disagree with its agenda. At first, they began using social humiliation, but now they've graduated to violence even through groups like Antifa and Black Lives Matter riots. Today, some of their radical goals of the woke culture are. Now, I want you to understand they started off with just an awareness of discrimination, the injustices done that were true injustices. Those who have been done wrong, violated, that they, they need justice for. So it started off, I believe, with good 
reasoning and, and good alternatives to, to these things that are happening. Well, let's, let's offset that with this. Let's change this. Let's be aware of these things. And people begin to speak out about things. But it's morphed into this agenda. And this is where we need to be aware because they're teaching this in a lot of our schools already across this country. Their goals are the following. Dissolve the nuclear family. Dissolve the nuclear family. Abolish capitalism. The opposite of that is socialism, by the way. Abolish capitalism. If you wanted to go and start your own business, make your way, the American dream, all of that's gone under their, their goals, their radical goals. Eliminate religion. Rewrite our constitution. Raise children gender neutral. Where did the bathroom issue come from? And how did we remove the term she, he from our government buildings that Nancy Pelosi in her wicked, evil agenda passed and pushed that she could no longer reference? Even Disney has removed it from their parks and you're not allowed to say he, she, or even with families. You can't mention that. That word, you can't do that. Family, he, she. This is who was behind that and still is behind it. Where did we go from discrimination to this? You know, it's a, it's a guise of good things, but beneath it is a hidden agenda. To rewrite our constitution, raise gender, gender neutral children, defunding law enforcement. Who do you think is behind that? I mean, that's ludicrous, right? The thought is ludicrous. It's foolishness. Defunding law enforcement because of, of the, the isolated, listen, incidences of the media and police brutality under that guise. Listen, in there, our law enforcement does a great job. And I know, are there isolated incidences where maybe things were, went too far? Absolutely. But we don't defund the police. We retrain. We re-equip where it was necessary. They have also been a part of canceling certain movies and cartoon characters that don't line up with their crazy radical goals. Erasing history that they deem as painful or against their cause. Do you know we went through and we still are going through a period where towns and statues and things about their history have been ripped down. This is behind that. Marxism, which is where it sprung from, by definition is the political, economic, and social principles and policies advocated by this Marx guy. It's a theory and practice of socialism whose ultimate goal is to have a classless society. Everybody's equal. Everybody's the same. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? But we know what socialism is, don't we? It should be noted that many people who are involved today in the woke culture are well-intentioned. They're well-intentioned. Most of them were indoctrinated into the woke ideology by their Marxist professors who have infiltrated deeply into our colleges. Some colleges that started off, well, all of our colleges started off Christian at one time, the, the older colleges. The woke ide ideology by their Marxist professors and not, reali or not realizing that they are unwitting participants in a grand social experiment. Because all of this on the surface, wouldn't you want equality? Well, don't you want social justice for people who've been done wrong? Don't you think that racial discrimination is wrong? Absolutely. But what they don't share is all of these other things that is their hidden agenda to do. 
radically change our country. So they started off with noble and good, but God's word tells us be discerning. Be discerning, be educated in how to respond. So let me tell you what Paul also told Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Are y'all with me? You with me, aren't you? 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. He says, I solemnly exhort you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. He says, Timothy, you keep preaching the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. That's our duty as a church, as the body of Christ. For the time is going to come. Will they, not, will, they will not tolerate sound doctrine. That time is already here. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers, professors, in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, things that are not true, philosophies, in other words. But as for you, use self-restraint in all things. Endure this hardship, he says. Do the work of an evangelist. Do you know what evangelist does? They go out and they tell the truth about who Jesus is. Fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. So we know, we know that the, the woke movement, we know what it is, but B, cancel culture. What is cancel culture? Just briefly, cancel culture. Cancel culture is a social environment in which they publicly boycott or withdraw support for people who are in the limelight, so to speak whether it's um, Hollywood, movie stars, uh, anyone who has popularity, a politician, anyone in the news, organizations, etc., and anything that they deem, they're promoting something socially unacceptable. They will call for a complete boycott and even riot where they're speaking or what they're doing. Now you have to understand that we in here tonight and truth like this, information like this, and we take a stand against uh, banning religion or banning law enforcement or raising gender neutral children and the laws they're trying to pass to, to where parents don't have a say so. If, if your child, your young child, nine or 10 years old wants to have a sex change, they're trying to take the right away from the parent to be able to say, no, I'm not gonna let my child do that. But do you know where the influence is coming in? The influence is coming in is social media, TikTok, all of these things that are out there that we're freely giving our children to expose them to these things. And our school systems and our colleges, we're sending our, our kids off to these liberal colleges. And if they're not well-versed, if they're not educated, then they'll fall prey to these things. And so by saying that we take a stand against this, then they would want to cancel this culture, meaning Christianity. If you disagree with anything that they stand for, even though they want equal rights, they really don't. They don't want equal rights. They don't want anybody to have any rights that speaks against their hidden agendas. They're crazy ideologies. So that, in a nutshell, is what cancel culture means. Anybody who goes against or socially, we don't agree with what you're saying. We're just going to raise up this great force against you and go after your sponsors or anybody who supports you and cut off all of those things because we don't like you and we don't like what you stand for. Now that sounds pretty good when you're talking about someone who has sexually violated a lot of women. You know, that kind of movement. But they do it in other arenas too. Good arenas. So that's cancel culture in a nutshell. C, social justice. A lot of popular Christian leaders, a lot of them have fallen prey to some of the social justice 
reasoning. They've fallen prey to the hidden agendas. They've began pushing it. And a lot of them have lost a lot of footing and standing in the church. And some of them who have done it, especially the women, I have been very disheartened by. Very disheartened by. Because it sounds good on the surface. Social justice is justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. Equal distribution. So it takes away that, that thinking of the American dream that you earn this and that social justice is, no, we need equality for everyone. It's, it's, it's what, you know, socialism is itself, communism. It's rooted in it, and it sounds good, but who's going to decide? Say, if, if, if I had worked hard and I became a millionaire... Who's going to decide what you can give of mine so others can be equally distributed? Why would I have to pay for you to be equal with me if I've worked hard for 20 years to get here and you haven't? That's the, listen, that's injustice. That is social injustice. The very thing that they're fighting for, they're really doing it on the other side. Defining social justice. While formal definitions for social justice vary, there are commonalities, and there are three. Equal rights, equal opportunity, and equal treatment. That sounds fair, doesn't it? I agree with those things. We ought to all have equal rights. Our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution align with these things. They declare these things. Equal opportunity. Equal opportunity, though, means that if I go and I'm better qualified for a job than this person, and maybe they have a, they're a different nationality or a different gender, and man, I, I'm not picking on you, but let's just say you're a man and I was better qualified for the job. If they gave the job to a man and not to me simply because I was a woman, then that's not equal rights, is it? No. So that's kind of the, the stance that they take. And it sounds good. because. But on the other hand, I shouldn't have to hire you just because you're a woman because we don't have enough women percentages in our company and we're getting slammed by these groups. And even though I've got a man right here that's worked for this company for 25 years and he needs to be promoted... And a woman comes in, and if I don't give it to her, then we're going to be in the news. That's wrong. That's wrong. So equal rights, it sounds good, but we're, we, they've taken it to an extreme. We need to understand what's beneath it. So let me give you, at its core, at its core, your note right here, it is a covering for socialism, these things. At its core, these things are a covering for socialism, which is where they want to take this country. They want to remove God from our country. They want to remove our history from our country, which is the first things the Nazis began to do. We cannot allow them to remove our history. With that said, God has created us all equal and in his image. God's word even tells us, Jesus said, in heaven, there's neither male nor female. Gentile nor Greek, in other words, or Jew or Gentile, meaning we're not going to just label you as a woman and label you as a man, even though when you're there, you know, this, this body, we, we don't understand what this resurrected body transforms is going to be. But he said, in other words, it's not like a gender neutral that the world is trying to pull out and twist. It means we're not going to see you as one or the other. Meaning one doesn't have more weight than the other is how that's translated. God's created us equal, meaning I don't have to earn anything. Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean that I can't come to the Lord or just because my skin's a different color. We're all equal, meaning we're loved the same in God's eyes, no matter what the, our nationality is. No matter what our gender is, we are born with this God-ordained value. But we are born with the ability to do good and evil and with the need for a Savior. Now let me say this, racism against any race 
black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Jew, Latino, it's all ungodly. It's all ungodly. I think most of us, no matter the color of our skin or our nationality, we've all probably experienced discrimination to some level at some time in our lives. Well, I think they treated me a little different because I'm this, or I, I'm, I'm not dressed good enough, or my economic status, or I think we've all probably experienced a, a certain level of discrimination in our life. Evil's never going to go away until the end of time, and all things come to fulfillment. It's always going to be a challenge. I will say this, and we don't have a lot of time, but a lot of this is rooted, it comes out of the woke movement and racism. Um, it, it comes out, it does come out, it is rooted in the black community. A lot of the, a lot of the movement has come out of the hurts of past issues such as slavery. When we look at God's word, slavery is an atrocity against the human soul that's made in the likeness of a holy God. The, the fight against slavery is still ongoing worldwide in our country, meaning sex trafficking and human trafficking is slavery. These movements or agendas that we've talked about, they began with an offense this offense that carried into discrimination over the years, the offense of persecution such as, as slavery and um, these dictatorships that have risen in the past. History of slavery, when we open the Bible, really the first that we really know where slaves came from was out of Egypt. We know Abraham had servants, they're called in the Bible, that traveled with him, but that little slave called Hagar from Egypt. And we know that well, if we opened up Genesis 15, 13, and 14, God tells Abraham, your descendants will be enslaved in a land in Egypt that's not theirs. They will be enslaved and oppressed for over 400 years. So we know the Jews were enslaved for over 400 years. When you keep reading in their history in the Bible, they were also for 70 years taken into captivity by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. 70 more years. And then there's the Holocaust. We could look at the Holocaust, which goes beyond slavery, even though they did work in concentration camps, and I get that. But it's that deep, that atrocity that they took them out and they killed over six million Jews. Millions. We can't erase that history. But that's what communism and socialism got us. That's where it took us. You say, how could that have happened? That was just in the 1940s. That hasn't been that long ago. How could such a thing happen? It can happen because somebody didn't stand up when the, all the signs were there and when it was brewing, when something like a woke movement was happening, uh, but on a different level. When these things happen and we don't get under the hidden agenda of it, we'll be brought into things that are not good, that really are bent on evil the transatlantic slave trade began in the early 1500s and went to the mid-1800s, and it roughly uprooted 12 million Africans, depositing 5 million approximately in Brazil, over 3 million in the Caribbean, and in America, 400, roughly 400,000. Thank God we had a president, President Abraham Lincoln, even though it almost cost him his presidency, he fought and formally freed the enslaved people in the South, which we know as the Civil War. With the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, we know that that took place and it freed them. The passage, it wasn't until the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865 two years later, that it was formally abolished in the United States. In the end, 246 brutal years of slavery had made its enduring mark upon American society. 
if a slave, an African slave in America had a baby, it was deemed the property of their owner. It was an atrocity, just like the atrocity against the Jews. Listen, in other, other nationalities throughout history, it's not just the Jews and the Africans that were brought over here. It's an atrocity against any people. But what is a greater atrocity to me is to take the sufferings of that and the continuation of things that they did suffer and racism did continue. Like it or not, it did. When and segregation, all of that. I mean, I look back and I'm ashamed of who we were. I'm ashamed of that. But what's a greater atrocity today is to take the sufferings of such a people who did help make this country great in the beginning by helping to build these colonies, to take their sufferings and hide your agenda under it to take a whole nation away from God. When the only answer for coming together is God. That's a greater atrocity to me. To paint such a lie to people to follow your evil agenda. Ephesians 5, 13 through 16. It says, all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything becomes visible then. For it, it, this reason it says, awake sleeper. Listen, you know God, when we go back and we trace the woke movement, do you know it really started with God? Awake. It's in the Old Testament too. Wake up. And I, I hate it because it says you women of ease in the Old Testament. <laughs> the women were sleeping. He says, wake up. But he says, wake up and arise from the dead. Listen, dead to your trespasses. And he says, and Christ will shine on you. So then, be careful how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Let me give you a note right here. We make the most of our time not trying to make wrongs right in the eyes of the world, but to live right in the eyes of God. We make the most of our time not trying to make wrongs right in the eyes of the world, but to live right in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God. We make the most of our time not trying to make wrongs right in the eyes of the world, but to live right in the eyes of God. Let me give you point number two. Real quickly, let me give you some points. We must not build a platform for hate. If it's a platform built on what you're against rather than what you're for, then that oftentimes equals and results in hate. We must not build a platform of hate, and these hidden agendas are based on hate, even though the things that they hate are wrong but it's still hate. 1 John 2, 9 through 11. Listen, when it's hate against people. 1 John 2, 9, 11. The one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I believe the reasonings for a lot of these causes are good when they first started. But when you're fueled by hatred for your fellow man, God is not in that. God is not in that. Hate here means to detest or to persecute or to love less. To persecute or detest. Let me give you a a nugget. Well, let me give you Deuteronomy 27, 19. And I know this is a lot, so hang with me. We're almost finished. Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed is he who distorts justice. Do an alien, an orphan, and a widow. And he says, and all the people say amen. What I do see happening, and the church needs to be aware of, they've taken justice and they've dwarfed it. Because our nugget here is social justice is not the same as biblical justice. 
social justice is not the same as biblical justice. It is not the same. You see, we do live in a fallen world. There will always be injustices and dis discrimination on every level. Not just skin color or ethnicity, but gender differences, belief differences. We'll always have these issues because we live in a fallen world. But do you know what Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 4 through 9? And we're not going to read all of it for time. But he says, don't merely look out for your own personal interests. And that's what a lot of these organizations do. They're looking out for their, per, their personal interests. But for the interest of others, have this attitude which is, was in Christ in yourself. Because it says, although he existed in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Do you see equality? That's what they're after. But equality is not something that even Jesus reached for. And what infuriates me in some of these sites is they say that Jesus was about social justice. Jesus was about the kingdom of God. He never addressed social injustice in the area that they're saying that he did. He never taught equality among each other. Jesus didn't even have a house that he lived in. His apostles went out and lived. They didn't have homes, many of them. They did without. They worked with their hands, not owning anything. They sold all their belongings, the early Christians. You see, just, uh, listen, they sold it not to be equal. They sold it to further the gospel, to give it to Paul, who's traveling over here, or Titus over here. That was the equality that Jesus was talking about, that all would hear the gospel. That's true equality. Let me give you a nugget. A half truth is but a whole lie. A half truth is but a whole lie. We must not build our platforms on hate. And let me give you one final thing, because our time is up. We must not build a platform for our offenses, meaning to seek payment for wrongs suffered. And that's where these platforms have been anchored in. They're seeking a platform based out of their offenses, a platform that seeks payment of wrongs suffered. Listen, years ago, back in the 1800s, we want you to pay a people to pay now for something that another people did to another people. That's ludicrous. That's ludicrous. You think, how can we do that? God's Word teaches a different lesson for us from the cross. Luke chapter 23, we could go to the Gospels. From the cross, Jesus said of his enemies, forgive them. Peter said, how many times, Lord, do we have to forgive? Seventy times seven. He told his disciples, you keep forgiving. It's about forgiveness to display the love of Christ. Jesus never demanded retribution. He never demanded God take vengeance on his enemies. Jesus was not for social justice. He never did that. He was for building the kingdom of God. That was his agenda. Douglas MacArthur said this, I am convinced for the security of our great nation, not so much because of any threat from without, but because of the insidious forces working from within. We ought to be concerned for our country. You see, we cannot build a platform base of hate or to seek for our offenses. And let me close. I'm going to give you a quote by John MacArthur, and, and he's going to have to find this. But I want to give you, I want to read 1 Corinthians, Brian, under point number three. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 says this, and I want you to get a hold of this. 
Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. Riots. Ugly, demeaning things. Hurting other people. Looting stores. Catching thing on, things on fire of innocent people. It doesn't act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. And here it is. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Even if you think you have the right to. No matter what has been done to you. No matter if somebody has violated you sexually. Or if they have discriminated against you. Jesus said, you will know them. Listen, they're all going to know by the love you have for one another. That's the mark of a true disciple. In this kind of love, it does not take into account wrong suffered. It forgives. It doesn't seek its own agenda. It doesn't seek its own agenda. You see, a good test for us, a good test for us, is found in Proverbs 6, 17 through 19. The seven abominations in the eyes of God. And he says, haughty eyes, that I'm better than you. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. The woke movement, although it started good, social injustice, cancel culture, all of these, the mark of love in their actions and the agendas they're pushing, it's not there. It may have started there, but today it has an evil agenda. And as God's people, we need to speak out and stop being afraid of the retribution because we're going to be called out. I'm called out on a regular basis. You get used to it. You see, this is a good test to see if something's aligned. You see, we must not look for justice or equality from earth when it is a source only given from heaven. We're equal. I want equality with God. I can't be seeking equality with you. You're not the source of equality. We must not surrender truth in order to restore what we believe has been removed. We can't do that as a people, and we can't allow that to be done. And we must not sin against the truth in order to oust a lie. Do you know what offense we should take up? If we take up any offense, it should be the offense of Christ. If we have any cause, it should be the kingdom of heaven. Jesus taught the opposite in his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. So it's the humble. It's the low road. It's not exerting yourself to be heard, seen, known, or equal, or appreciated, or advanced. Then it becomes about ourself. And if it's based on an offense, it will always be tainted and it will be fueled by hate. And as God's people, we need to start standing up against these things that these so-called good organizations, on the surface it seems good, but it's the agenda that we need to look at. What is your agenda? What are you trying to do underneath that we don't see until it's already here? If you haven't reached out and called your schools, if you haven't reached out to your congressmen, your senators, and those in your communities, it starts on the local level, then you need to do so. We need to know what they're trying to pass and teaching in our schools. A lot of states have already passed to teach this. We need to stand against that. Do you know that if all Christians voted we would be led by Christian leaders in this country. 